It's, this is a bit weird. It's a, a one-way conversation with typed feedback. But anyway, welcome everybody. Uh, I expect a few others will join. So I'm here uh, as the guest of, of Sarah, Sarah Walker, and I think this is only the second time that this system has been used, so I will try and do it properly. Uh, so uh, I thought I would just talk for a few minutes about how I uh, blundered into the field of astrobiology and the type of research that interests me at the moment, and then we can go into a sort of Q&A session. So, uh, as many of you may know, I uh, was educated in the UK, in London. I was a student at University College London, where I did my PhD. And already as a student, I got interested in the problem of life, because my uh, degrees are in physics and uh, theoretical physics, and so, to a theoretical physicist, life looks nothing less than magic. Uh, and I read Schrodinger's little book, What is Life?, as a student, and I thought, well, it is deeply, deeply puzzling to a physicist how life does all these clever things. Uh, but that was just really subliminal. That was in the back of my mind for many years. Uh, the second turning point that got me seriously interested in uh, the the what we would now call astrobiology, no one used the term then, was a conference organized in 1983 in Cambridge by Martin Rees. Uh, it was called From Matter to Life. And the other people at that conference will be familiar to you. Tommy Gold was there, and Freeman Dyson, and Sidney Brenner, John Conway, Graham Cairn Smith, uh, a whole bunch of people, Lewis Wolpert, developmental biologist, and uh, that really cemented in my mind the fact that the transition from non-life to life uh, is a puzzle, a deep puzzle, and one that uh, physicists as well as biologists need to think about. And so that really set the scene, uh, but the trigger that got me professionally involved in what is now astrobiology uh, can be traced, I think, to 1980 time, 1989. At that time, I was at the University of Newcastle-upon-Tyne in the northeast of England, and a lot of the department were geophysicists, and these were led by Keith Runcorn. And Keith had organized that the 50th anniversary meeting of the Meteoritic Society was to be held in Newcastle. Now, I didn't know anything about meteorites, but I thought I would just go along and hang out, and that's why I learned about the Mars meteorites, still very controversial at that stage. I remember asking Keith Runcorn, well, how did they get here? Nobody knows, is the way he answered. Uh, and so uh, at that stage, 1990, I went to Australia, to the University of Adelaide, and there I met uh, Duncan Steele. And Duncan was working on asteroid and comet impacts. Uh, in fact, he was the only person in the Southern Hemisphere uh, looking for Earth-intersecting asteroids at that time. And so I got interested in impacts. And then, because of my links with Tommy Gold from that 1983 conference, I learned about his theory that we now call the deep hot biosphere. And, of course, nobody believed it. Nobody thought there could be life deep underground. Uh, but I was prepared to consider that. And putting two and two together, impacts uh, propelling material from Mars to Earth, and inevitably from Earth to Mars, plus life inside rocks, to me, spelt what we might call panspermia. Now, uh, I'd already had a brush with panspermia because my postdoc in Cambridge in 1970 was with Fred Hoyle. And uh, Fred was developing the idea with Chandra Wickrama Singh of uh, what they were calling diseases from space, microbes and even viruses uh, propagating across interstellar space. So I knew about the conventional panspermia theory. I was very skeptical. But here, uh, cocooned inside a rock, we had the possibility of a transfer of life between Mars and Earth, or Earth and Mars, uh, in the rock, protected from the rigors of outer space. And so I wrote about that idea, and it came to the attention of Malcolm Walter, who is um, a geologist by training, now an astrobiologist, uh, and he invited me to a meeting in London at which I presented this idea of rocks conveying microbes between Mars and Earth and the, and the other way. And I was more or less laughed out of the conference. There were only one or two people who were prepared to uh, to take that idea seriously. Now, unbeknownst to me, uh, the um, 
there had been one or two other people who had come up uh, with this idea, most notably Jay Melosh, uh, but it was still very, very controversial to suggest that life could be transferred between planets in this manner. And so uh, what happened next uh, was one of these strange twists of fate. Uh, it, uh, some of you may remember, in August uh, 1996, when President Bill Clinton stood on the White House lawn and announced that NASA had evidence of life on Mars. And he was referring to the Allen Hills meteorite. So uh, there's a long history came after that you'll be familiar with. But the point is that that served to concentrate attention on the possibility of the transfer of microorganisms, live microorganisms, between Earth and Mars inside rocks. And so now I think today this theory, which I was championing in the early 90s and uh, got laughed at, is now considered the party line. And that sufficed to get me into the astrobiology community, it got their attention, and I helped Mark and Walter set up the Australian Centre for Astrobiology. And then I came here to Arizona State University about six years ago, uh, determined to develop uh, the astrobiology side of my interests, but also to retain my interests and work in theoretical physics and cosmology. And that's what I've done. And so I've gone back to my original fascination with the subject of the transition from non-life to life, the origin of life. And Sarah and I have been working on ideas about how life could have arisen in the first place and how to define life in terms of its information flow and information management. And I can certainly answer questions about that. So that briefly is how I got into this subject. I'm still uh, at heart a theoretical physicist, uh, but astrobiology is so deeply intriguing that I follow very carefully what is going on. So we can start dealing with some questions, uh, if we have some out there. So Sarah's asking if you can hear this, where, why does a physicist find life so weird? Um, and I think the point is, there are two things I could say. One is that uh, physicists are used to thinking in terms of universal principles, deep principles that apply to everything. We just need to think of the law of gravitation, for example. Uh, the point about life is that it is not so much... Um, uh, operating according to principles. It's a state of matter, and a very complex state. Uh, and so we'd like to believe that it's not just doing arbitrary things. But if you take uh, even something as simple as a bacterium, take two of them, no two are identical, but they have some features in common. And the question we'd really like to know is, are these common features part of some deep principles that one could write down in terms of equations? Or are, uh, are they just is everyone just uh, contingent upon its environment and the things that act on it? So uh, it's very natural for physicists to want there to be deep universal principles. And there may be. The only principle that we are sure of that governs all of life is Darwinism. So we know that works. But that's never seemed very deep principle to me. It seemed just a very obvious sort of thing. Uh, and so uh, I'm intrigued to know whether there is something that we can grasp at a deeper level about the way uh, living systems are organized that makes them stand out in contrast to, to other systems. And that transition of going from stupid atoms that just blunder around, push and pull on each other uh, according to whatever forces are acting, and something like uh, any living organism, however simple, that harnesses the physical forces in its environment rather than just uh, responds to them, actually harnesses them for an agenda. They're pre-programmed to do stuff. How that whole notion of uh, the management of information internally, but the manipulation or harnessing of the environment, how that emerges from atoms that at the atomic level just push and pull on each other, I think is still deeply mysterious. I don't believe in magic and I don't think we need vitalism. But I think that we don't yet understand how to connect together the realm of physics, which is formulated in terms of uh, matter and particles and forces and energy, and the realm of biology that is cast in informational language of uh, signaling and uh, translation and transcription and codes. Uh, these are two conceptually different universes, and somehow we have to join them together. The, challenge of life's origin is making that transition from 
the world of matter to the world of information. Don't know how to do it yet, but we've got some ideas. We're working on that here, Sarah and I. So Dan Mills is asking, could I give a brief description of information theory and how it relates to the origin of life? A brief description? Goodness me. So uh, whole textbooks are filled, um, but I'll have a go. Uh, it's, um, it's very clear uh, that uh, if you take uh, any sort of uh, distribution of, uh, of points, or it could be something like leaves on a... On a forest floor or raindrops on the, the pavement, that their uh, position uh, in some sense encodes information. That, that is, to describe that system, you'd have to give numbers. Uh, and if you uh, have a different pattern, you give different numbers. So it's a way of encoding information. But that type of information is not very interesting. Uh, it's often said that uh, DNA as an information database, and it is, it's uh, the sequence of nucleotides in DNA encodes information, uh, but uh, there's something more to it than just uh, being a sequence. You take a different sequence, it's of course uh, different information, maybe the same total number of bits, but different information. What we recognize in biology is that a gene uh, is more than just bits of information. Uh, it's a set of instructions uh, for something to happen, maybe for a ribosome to make um, a protein. Uh, and that protein matters because it has biological functionality. So there's a whole lot of knock-on consequences that attaches to that information. You can't just look at one nucleotide and say, is that coding for something? Uh, do, will that do something? Does that matter? Or could I change it to something else? You can't tell by looking. It's only in the context of the entire system. So we're now into the notion of information which is not just raw bits localized uh, in a polymer. It's an entire milieu, an entire environment, an entire context that turns mere bits into uh, something that's alive. I mean, something with biological functionality. Uh, and so the challenge is to capture that quality of functional or contextual information as opposed to just um, any old bits. Now, that doesn't do justice to the whole field of uh, information theory. I should mention, uh, parenthetically, that uh, Claude Shannon in the Second World War was given the task of optimizing the amount of information that could be transmitted down a noisy telephone line. It's obviously a great practical significance. Uh, and Shannon developed modern information theory uh, in terms of, um, of how, uh, what, what was the maximum rate of information uh, down the line, uh, and that's all fine, uh, but he carefully steered clear of any discussion about whether the information were to mean anything. So it's quite different uh, if it's just noise going down the line uh, or just random bits, uh, quite different from, uh, for example, coded information to explode a nuclear weapon. I mean, obviously, they are very, very different in their significance. And the point about life is that it's not just um, any old bits being being organized or moved around or transmitted. Uh, it is um, instructional bits. And, and that's the thing that is very difficult uh, as a physicist to get to grips with. Last part of Dan's question, how does it relate to the origin of life? Well, of course, the origin of life is precisely, in my view, uh, what matters is precisely where we go uh, from just uh, atoms and molecules, which undoubtedly have information in the sense that we would need information to describe their uh, positions or the sequence or so on. Um, they have information that doesn't do anything in the, in the biological sense. The transition from that to the realm of uh, meaningful or contextual information. Uh, so that's the, the hard thing. So I, but Sarah and I, but I think uh, we're on the same page here. We uh, both identify life's origin precisely with that transition in going from uh, just mere bits to contextual or um, uh, meaningful bits, uh, semantic bits, something of, of that sort. It's a, a very difficult thing. We don't know how to make that objective. We don't know how to uh, make it mathematical, but we're, we're working on it. A question here by Julia. Uh, well, she mentions that I'm uh, doing cancer research as well. I skipped by that bit. Um, 
could you explain a little bit how a theoretical physicist got into that work and how it relates to astrobiology? Yes, how long have we got? Um, so, I indeed it's true. Uh, I love to tell people that my last uh, formal instruction in biology was in 1962. So, <laughs> you see, it's been a long while. Uh, so I've had to learn uh, the biology and the astrobiology sort of on the, on the fly. Uh, but um, uh, it was enough uh, that when, about five years ago, I, out of the blue, received a phone call from Anna Barker, who was at that time Deputy Director of the National Cancer Institute, uh, that she knew I created the Beyond Center for Fundamental Concepts in Science, which uh, is right across the sciences, examines deep foundational issues, uh, things like what is life and could there be more than one form of life on Earth and how did the universe come to exist and where do the laws of physics come from? Uh, can we uh, travel in time? Uh, can we colonize other planets? All of these things is what we think about. And she said, well, we need that type of uh, really deep, big, challenging, provocative thinking in cancer research because uh, cancer research, if I can give my own personal view, is grossly overfunded. And what happens if you overfund something uh, is that people scramble for their little piece of the pie and then they drill down into some tiny little corner of the subject that, uh, on which they have expertise and then they very comfortably chug, chug along. Uh, and so uh, with uh, enormous prescience, Anna Barker perceived that if uh, she could bring in scientists from other disciplines that had no preconceptions about cancer, then it may lead to wholly new insights. So instead of people being very narrowly focused, uh, they uh, might stand back and see the, the bigger picture. And so I took up that challenge. I helped uh, organize some workshops at the National Cancer Institute. And then that culminated in a funding round. Uh, there are 12 centers of physical science and cancer biology uh, in the United States. I'm running the one here at ASU. And we just finished a workshop uh, at the end of last week. It was on cancer dormancy. Uh, and I just very briefly tell you my take on this, uh, that my feeling about cancer is it's not a disease to be cured, it's a condition to be managed. It's part of life, and uh, ju just like aging, uh, you can mitigate its effects, but you can't make it go away. Uh, and it's well known that many cancers go through a period of dormancy that may last years or even decades uh, before it returns, uh, even more malignant than before. If we can figure out why uh, that uh, dormancy occurs. So, and, and I'm thinking in astrobiological terms of you know dormant uh, bacteria in rocks between Earth and Mars, something like that. If there's a similar phenomenon going on in the human body, then uh, if we can extend that period of dormancy, say from 10 years to 100 years, the problem has completely gone away. So that's my take on it. Um, it does have an astrobiology connection? In fact, a, a number of them because cancer. Uh, when you uh, stop to think about it, I said it's not a, just a human disease to be cured, it's a, a condition to be managed, and indeed you find cancer among all mammals, fish, birds, even plants, it's very deeply embedded in the biosphere, uh, and I think that its deep evolutionary roots can be traced back at least as far as the origin of multicellularity, and possibly as far back as eukaryogenesis. So in other words, uh, ordinary healthy cells in your body come with an embedded cancer subroutine, uh, which is normally silenced, but can be activated uh, if there's some sort of insult uh, in later life. And that the reason that it's still there, this subroutine, is because those genes are crucial dur during embryogenesis. Uh, and so uh, my feeling is that by bringing in astrobiologists together with cancer biologists, and I'm trying to do this, I've established lots of links between the NAI and the NCI, uh, and we're running joint workshops, uh, and, and the virtue of bringing in astrobiologists is that these are people who think um, not only about the nature of life on Earth, but what alternative forms of life might be like. Go to Mars, find life, it might be a different form of life. So they really think very deeply about what is life. And when you see something in biology that is so pervasive and so deeply embedded and so efficient as cancer, uh, you realize this isn't a quirky little aberration. It's something that is a deep-rooted part of the story of life itself. And there's no better people than astrobiologists to tell the great story of life. And so I think there's a lot of ground uh, for 
um, for overlap. Uh, and uh, one last thing I'll just say on that score, very specific overlapping con connection with uh, oxidative stress and hypoxia. Cancer turns out to prefer fermentation, that is glycolysis, over oxidation phosphorylation. Uh, it prefers that it can operate well in hypoxic conditions. It's almost as if it's trying to recapitulate an ancient lifestyle, and that's indeed what I believe is happening. I think that as uh, cells in the body become deregulated, they default back to ancestral phenotypes. And if you go back far enough, it's in effect back to the selfish cell stage. So we're describing, I'm um, doing this work uh, in collaboration with Charlie Lineweaver uh, at the Australian National University, and we're describing this as Metazoa 1.0. Cancers are Metazoa 1.0, whereas um, most organisms that we, we know are Metazoa 2.0, uh, later, more refined, evolved organisms. So enough of that, enough of cancer, let's move on down. Um, now... Uh, Aditya, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, Aditya Top, uh, Chopra uh, is saying, uh, and thermodynamics too, being a fundamental feature of life. Yeah, of course. So now the point is, as Schroeder, if you read Schrodinger's little book, uh, it's about um, the uh, obvious way in which life seems to buck the thermodynamic trend. Thermodynamics, of course, tells us that systems tend to degenerate. Uh, they uh, generate entropy. Uh, they become more and more chaotic, and life uh, doesn't go from ordered to disordered, it goes from ordered to ordered. Uh, and Schrodinger had a nice turn of phrase. He said that uh, living organisms drink orderliness uh, from, well, in most cases, from, from the sun, from the free energy provided by the sun. Uh, and so thermodynamics is, of course, an essential part of the nature of life, and we're going to have a workshop on that uh, in May, uh, on that very subject a workshop on on thermodynamics well we're calling it engines of life so it's th on thermodynamics and metabolic pathways to life so of course the thermodynamics is an important part of the story uh, and one of the things that interests me just to mention again about cancer is whether the thermodynamics of cancer cells differs radically from those of healthy cells i think it does uh, so of course that's part of it but don't think uh, that just because life does not violate the second law of thermodynamics, and it doesn't, because um, a, if a living system becomes more ordered, there's an entropic price to be paid in the environment. So when you uh, tot up the sums, the entropy always goes up. Uh, but that doesn't mean thermodynamics has explained life. Thermodynamics is consistent with life, uh, but it doesn't explain life. We're still... Uh, stuck with that problem of information and meaningful information. There's a deep link between information, and maybe this is the, the purpose of the question, between Shannon information and entropy. In fact, uh, there's a famous story that when Shannon was uh, struggling with this uh, the theory of communication, uh, he asked uh, John von Neumann, he had this uh, mathematical quantity uh, that he wanted to describe, and von Neumann reportedly said, uh, we'll call it entropy, uh, that's a good name because nobody knows what entropy is anyway, uh, and so you can get away with it. So there is a deep link between entropy and information. They're the sort of flip sides of each other. Betol. Do universal principles translate into evolutionary trajectories leading to, to the same outcome anywhere in the universe? Um, okay. Uh, well, um, not necessarily. So uh, in physics, it's certainly the case that if you take the universal laws of motion, say the laws of gravitation and Newton's laws of motion, and you specify the initial conditions, then it's a deterministic system. And the, there's the famous metaphor of the Laplace demon who uh, uh, knows at one time the positions of motions of all the particles in the universe and then can deduce everything that ever will happen and everything that ever has happened. Um, so I don't think a universal principle needs to tie things down uh, like that. Um, let me uh, uh, try and recast this so you can see what I mean. Um, now first of all, I should say that, that if biology has universal principles, they're only going to be quasi-universal. That is, these are likely to be principles that would not apply to uh, the cooker in my kitchen or something like that, but, but to a restricted class of, of systems, namely living systems. Um, but 
one of the ways we can think about uh, how life operates. We can co concentrate on all the intricate details, the biochemistry and the molecular biology and so on, but we can also uh, stand back and take a systems approach and we can look and say, well, what does this component do? What does that component do? And how does it all fit together? Uh, and it's a little bit like an electronic uh, circuit or a computer circuit. It's a logic uh, circuit. Certain things uh, have effects on other things, and uh, maybe the fine details will affect the timing and so on. But life is very good uh, with its feedback loops and uh, homeostasis uh, to be able to uh, compensate for fluctuations at the atomic level. So the things that life does when it behaves according, as if according to a plan, well, that's indeed uh, what is going on. And so there's all these uh, logic circuits, um, and, and it's all encoded, of course, in the DNA and maybe elsewhere as well. Uh, and so what we should try to do is to understand if there are any principles governing that. So it's a little bit like if you say to a radio engineer, uh, here's a transistor radio, are there any principles governing that? Well, one answer is yes, the laws of physics govern that. But that's no help in fixing your transistor radio. Uh, there are other principles as well. They're not universal. They don't apply to, uh, um, you know, for example, the motion of the ocean. Uh, but they would apply uh, to uh, radio circuits. Uh, and so these would be quasi-universal principles. Every radio circuit has to comply with certain principles. Uh, but these principles are at a higher level than the underlying laws of physics. And I think that there could be such principles in living organisms as well. We don't know them yet. I mean, we can, we can make a few loose statements like uh, Mendel's laws of, of genetics, for example. Uh, uh, they're, not, they're not really laws in the sense of the laws of physics, uh, but they're regularities, which are... Um, quasi-universal. And I suspect that if we view life in terms of circuits of logical operations and information management, that we're going to find that there are other principles and we can write down equations and, um, in a general sense, maybe uh, predict certain things that are going to happen. But I think it will be a long time in the future before you could predict how I would vote in the next election based on any sort of uh, mathematical principles that apply to my body. I don't think that could ever be done. Okay, let's, uh, well, there's a, a supplement to that. Where do I stand in the chance versus determinism argument? Remember that we live in a quantum universe. And so, uh, like it or not, nothing is completely determined. Uh, and the world that bridges astrobiology and quantum physics uh, is if you have, say, a cosmic ray uh, that hits a particular nucleotide or whatever it hits to cause a, a mutation, uh, that's something governed by the laws of quantum mechanics, which has its famous uh, uncertainty. And so that may affect the outcome of evolution. The entire uh, course of evolution may uh, hinge on uh, that, that particular encounter, which is uh, subject to quantum mechanics. So uh, even if we had, if we could write down the wave function of the universe, uh, which is something else I work on, even if we could write that down, uh, it's still not going to tell us at a level of detail about, say, the course of evolution. So uh, remember always uh, also not only quantum physics, but biological systems are open systems. And determinism only works in closed systems. Uh, biological systems are open, and you can get into arguments about whether the universe as a whole is an open or a closed system. I don't want to get into that here. Um, but I think it's a bit of a spurious argument to worry about... Um, about uh, uh, determinism in the context of biology. Okay, let's move on down. Uh, thank you. There I have an idea on how you won't vote in the next elections, right? <laughs> uh, uh, to d disclose my circumstances, I, I can't vote for anybody. I'm not a US citizen. I'm a green card holder. Uh, and so I always tell my American friends that you should support the candidate who thinks that no taxation without representation is a good way to go, because I think that would be terrific. Um, so I pay my taxes, but I don't get to vote. Could you please give your insights into how astrobiology as a field might grow, if at all, in the years to come, and perhaps changes in how it is viewed by the wider community? Well, I must admit, having seen the genesis of this subject, I explained earlier how the word wasn't even used until about the mid-90s, and and this dramatic episode with Bill Clinton on the White House lawn. And I think after that, the subject of astrobiology uh, became very attractive. 
remember that this was uh, was a subject that already existed, but it was sort of scattered among different disciplines. And by giving it a sexy name and packaging it into, uh, uh, well, in the, this case of single funding body, the NAI, um, suddenly that uh, uh, propelled this subject to public attention. Um, and so it's had a bit of a dream run. Uh, there, um, there are, you know, within the, the NASA community, of course, there are some people who don't like biology. They think that uh, the space exploration should really be uh, all about uh, geology, earth sciences, and uh, planetary science, uh, and they don't want uh, want biology to get involved. But there's no doubt about it that if you look at uh, NASA press releases, the allusion to biology uh, is uh, running uh, throughout uh, a huge number of them. And so anything to do with planetary exploration usually is cast in the uh, tone that, that it's part of looking for life elsewhere, because I think the public is enormously interested in that idea. Of course, the public also has some wacky notions about UFOs and alien abductions and other stuff, but you know that's okay, we have to live with that. I think everybody's deeply fascinated by the question of are we alone in the universe? And when I wear a different hat, I like to talk about SETI, the search for extraterrestrial, not just life, but intelligence. And I've been closely involved with that throughout my career. I'm a SETI skeptic, but that's okay. You can be interested and uh, skeptical, and it doesn't mean you don't believe. It just means that you're taking a ske skeptical stance, and that's my position. Uh, so I think all these things are great. The question usually boils down to funding. Is, is that going to continue? Um, well, we're into local politics after the sequest. I don't know, just uh, this morning I got a message from NASA about, you know, what are we going to do? Um, uh, I've uh, lived long enough to see ups and downs uh, of funding uh, in Britain and then Australia and, and now in the United States. Uh, you know, these things come and go. Uh, and I'm sure that uh, science in general and astrobiology in particular has a future in the United States. There may be a, a bumpy few years ahead. I don't know. Um, in terms of what do we do, uh, well, let me just tell you that um, last month I was in uh, Chile. I went to a meeting in Santiago, a scientific congress of a general nature. Uh, and then after the congress, we were taken on a tour uh, to Paranal. Now, that's in the Atacama Desert. It's up high where the European Southern Observatory has its uh, telescopes. And when I got there, I learned that it was much more famous because the James Bond movie, Quantum of Solace, was filmed there. And indeed, some of the props have been left lying around when I was there. Uh, anyway, in discussing uh, their projects with them, and they have an 8.2 meter telescope, they're planning another one. I can't remember how big, but it's certainly bigger. Um, and they claim this will have the capability of uh, imaging the spectra of the atmospheres of extrasolar planets. And that's something that I didn't believe could be done from the Earth's surface. I thought we need something like the Terrestrial Planet Finder, a space-based system with fancy optics and uh, huge costs as associated with it. But I think the um, not only the active optics, uh, but the information processing uh, of ground-based optical telescopes has got so far, progressed so far, that they can foresee the ability to be able to actually get at the spectra of extracellular planets. And of course, if they see oxygen, uh, so I see that uh, David Grinspoon is among us. He may uh, uh, disagree with this, I don't know. Uh, oxygen alone is not an unambiguous signature of life, but it's certainly a pretty good indicator. And so if we find Earth-like planets with oxygen in their atmospheres, I think that's going to enormously boost the subject. So maybe that's the way it's going to go. Um, but uh, closer to home, uh, th those of us who've lived with the dream of, uh, of uh, finding life on Mars, even if it is uh, just the same as Earth life, because it's got there in rocks, um, uh, we've been very frustrated with uh, the slow pace of, uh, of astrobiology on Mars. I think um, in the mid-90s, everyone expected a Mars sample return mission to have happened already, and we'd be peering at Mars rocks looking for fossils or something. It uh, doesn't look like any sample return mission will happen anytime soon. Uh, but, you know, Mars is there. It remains my favorite candidate for finding life beyond Earth. Uh, and I did notice that uh, Mars just possibly might be hit by a comet later this year. Uh, and that will be a wonderful thing. 
because if the comet excavates a deep crater and if there's life in the subsurface of Mars, uh, then that would provide an unprecedented opportunity for accessing that subsurface biota because you could send a Viking type lander uh, to land in the crater and sample that uh, subsurface, which if we were lucky, would release water from uh, an aquifer uh, and uh, that water may contain microbes. So uh, there are all those sorts of things uh, that, are, that are possible. Uh, now, I guess we should move on. Yes, well, even if this comet doesn't actually hit Mars, it looks like it'll be a near miss and some of the cometary material will enter the Martian atmosphere and that in itself is interesting. Um, so Julia is asking, there are a few false positive scenarios for oxygen detection. Thank you for clarifying this. I'm certainly not an expert. So icy bodies can have a tenuous molecular oxygen due to photo dissociation. Right. But at small levels. Um, well, you see, I'm old enough to remember Gaia uh, and um, James Lovelock. Uh, this was in the context of could there be life on Mars and how will we know? And the key thing is some sort of disequilibrium. If you see a mixture of gases that... Um, if you leave them for a thousand years would uh, equilibrate and if you see them out of it, equilibrium then the, um, this can only come about if something's replenishing that and uh, that's one signature of life. So if you saw oxygen and methane together in the atmosphere of an extracellular planet I think that would be pretty much a giveaway. Uh, but, uh, but you know the, there's a lot of oxygen in the universe and we don't fully understand all those processes. I think the point is Oxygen's highly reactive, and so um, any Earth-like planet that had tectonic activity uh, would be gobbling up the oxygen pretty fast. Uh, and so, um, if those are the planets you're you're looking for, uh, then I think it's rather hard to think uh, there would be substantial amounts of oxygen over a long period of time. Okay, uh, what else have we got here? Uh, in your, this is from Dan Mills. In, in your view, once you have life, what needs to be met in order to per permit the evolution of complex multicellularity? Right, so there's a lecture in itself. Um, so let me uh, first say at the outset uh, that I have a particular point of view about SETI, which seems to not be shared by many people. Um, and it goes something like this. So when I was a student in London in the 60s, uh, almost nobody believed that there was life beyond Earth. And I often say... Uh, saying that you're interested in finding life beyond Earth was like saying you're interested in finding fairies. People just thought this was completely ludicrous. Now the pendulum has swung the other way, and it's fashionable to say that the universe is teeming with life. But actually, the scientific facts haven't changed a great deal in that time. Uh, now, you'll all know of something called the Drake Equation. Uh, this is uh, Frank Drake's attempt to catalogue our ignorance about the various factors that go into making up the expected number of communicating civilizations in the galaxy at this time. And uh, some of those numbers are now rather well known. For example, the rate of star formation, the number of stars with planets, and so on. Um, but about number three or four in that equation, you get to the fraction of Earth-like planets on which life emerges. Um, and Frank always liked to put that number, that fraction, at close to one. Uh, so that is uh, basically saying that life's origin is something which happens readily, that the probability of transitioning from non-life to life is a very high uh, in Earth-like conditions. That may be so, uh, but we have no reason to suppose it, uh, because we can easily imagine scenarios, for example, if there is a, a temperature filter, if life's origin depends on, say, 10 key steps, each of which has to take place in a different, rather narrow temperature range, there may only be one place in the entire observable universe where that sequence of temperatures happen to occur. I'm not suggesting this is so, but I'm saying um, it's very easy to imagine that life on Earth could be a bizarre aberration, the only life there is. Uh, and uh, because it's the only example we know, and we are it, there's obviously a selection effect. We can't deduce on the basis uh, that there is life here that it must be probable. Uh, if, there's, if it's very improbable, this is the life that we will observe. So I have to be really careful with these um, post-selection arguments. So I don't think we can tell anything uh, from the fact that we have a sample of one that life is either common or uncommon. So the error bars on that, that part of the Drake equation are enormous. And therefore, worrying about you know, what happens next um, seems to me to be a bit premature. 
because uh, we don't know uh, what what uh, that initial probability is. And people often ask me, they say, well, you know, what do you think the chances are of finding life elsewhere? And I say, well, how can I possibly say? You can only estimate the odds of something if you know what the mechanism is. Uh, so if I knew how non-life turned into life, I could have a go at estimating how likely that was in Earth-like circumstances. But because you don't know what did it, we can't possibly estimate the odds. Those odds could be very high or very low. Uh, and so uh, that really dominates the Drake equation because all of the rest um, is uh, easier than that step uh, to estimate. Um, and uh, the particular question is how likely is it that given, say, microbes, intelligent life will complex form life forms and maybe intelligent life will one day emerge? Well, again, we don't know how to do that calculation, but at least we know what the mechanism was. It was Darwinian evolution. The point is we don't know the mechanism that turned non-life into life. We do know the mechanism that turns simple life into complex life. We still don't know how to do the calculation, but at least we know the process. And so, in principle, we could have a go at calculating the odds of that. I think those odds are actually really rather small, and I base that um, on the fact that life on Earth, um, when you look at the various big uh, transitions that have occurred, say take the transition from single cells to multicellularity, it turns out that that's happened many times. I've seen an estimate of at least 20 times. So even though we don't really understand what went on, we can sort of assume if it happened independently 20 times that it can't be that improbable. Uh, and so if we take the step of intelligence, uh, it does seem that true intelligence of the spacecraft building variety uh, has really only happened once on Earth. Uh, and so therefore, uh, when you see something happening only once, it's possible it's still a quite a likely thing. It's again a sample of one, but it's equally possible it's extremely rare. Uh, and, um, and once again, uh, the only reason that we're discussing it is because we're here, we're the product of it. You can't go backwards, you can't retrodict that it's probable just because uh, we, we uh, are here. Um, there is an argument that people use, which I'll mention in passing, and I've dis described this in some detail in my book, The Eerie Silence, which is really a tribute to SETI, and uh, in spite of its non-success after 50 years, I still think it's a wonderful thing to try. Um, and in that book, I, I use an argument due to Brandon Carter. Um, and the argument uh, is the opposite of a famous saying by Carl Sagan. So here I am on the Sagan network. So Carl Sagan was a great inspiration, of course, for anyone interested in what we now call astrobiology. Uh, and he pointed out that life on Earth started pretty rapidly once conditions here settled down after the bombardment. Uh, and there's some quote that goes like, um, life must be easy to start because no sooner was Earth ready for it than up it pops. Um, well, uh, the rapid appearance of life on Earth is consistent with it being easy to start. It's also consistent with it being incredibly hard to start, and this is Carter's argument. Uh, it turns out that if the uh, expectation time for life to emerge from non-life is, if we could calculate it, supposing it turns out to be uh, a thousand uh, planetary lifetimes or you know a trillion years or something like that uh, if nevertheless against those odds it does happen and you select for that event by being it that is we we are here with the products of life um, then you can make that argument quantitative and work out the number of really hard steps that are involved the first one is what I've just been talking about there could be others like the emergence of intelligence if uh, these are all very hard steps, by which I mean the expectation time for them to happen is much longer than the age of the Earth, uh, then uh, you can um, either predict when the Earth will become uninhabitable, or you can turn this around and you can say, how much longer will Earth be habitable for? And the answer is about another 800 million years. And then infer that there are five or six of those very difficult steps. So if life is really difficult, looks like there are about five or six very difficult steps that have led up to us. Uh, and if life is really easy, well then, that's great. Everything we know is consistent with that, and then we could expect it to be widespread in the universe. Uh, and so whilst we're waiting to find life elsewhere in the universe, should that happen, 
There's one way we can test the idea that life does arise readily. That is, we can look for a second sample of life right here on Earth. If life pops up readily in Earth-like conditions, no planet is more Earth-like than Earth itself, and therefore life should have started many times over right here on planet Earth. Uh, how do we know it didn't? Has anybody actually looked? Uh, it turns out, until we had a workshop here uh, a few years ago on searching for a second sample of life on Earth, almost nobody had considered this. Astrobiologists are very good at thinking about what happens if we go to Mars or Europa or Enceladus and we find life there. You know, it won't be Earth life, so it might be some different form of life. Very good at thinking about what it might be like. Nobody thought, well, could there be a different form of life on Earth? How would we know if it's microbial only? We would never spot it. And so uh, we have uh, a program of research searching for the shadow biosphere, is the way we call it, to coin a phrase that was first used by uh, Shelley Copley and uh, um, Carol Cleland. Uh, and this shadow biosphere could be all around us. We uh, could find that uh, intermingled among the microbes that we know and love are microbes uh, that might look the same, but their innards would be sufficiently different that they could be attributed to another tree of life with an independent origin. So that's an exciting idea. We might be able to test this hypothesis that uh, of what Christian de Duve calls the cosmic imperative, that life inev is inevitable in Earth-like conditions, by not even leaving our home planet. Uh, now, there are some reasons why life could have started 50 times on Earth and only one prevailed in the end, and that would be a bit sad, but it's entirely possible, in my view, that there could be, uh, even now, more than one form of life on Earth. We should go out and look for it. Okay, Dan Mills again. Uh, simple multicellularities evolved independently 20 or so times, but complex multicellularities evolved only three to five times, right? And it's not clear why these groups appeared so late in Earth's history. Now, I think this uh, origin of multicellularity remains a challenge, and, and Sarah here has a, a project that is being funded by our National Cancer Institute initiative because, as I explained, we're trying to connect cancer with the emergence of multicellularity. And the way I like to express it, sounds very dramatic, that cancer uh, is built into the logic of life. It's, it's not just a little recent quirky aberration. It's built into the very logic of life itself, and multicellularity is part of that logic of life. Uh, but having said that, we don't know what that logic is. Uh, and in particular, the transition from unicellularity to multicellularity uh, is not easy to understand in terms of uh, a adaptive success and adaptive advantage. Uh, it's um, doing life the multicellular way is very different from doing it the unicellular way. In effect, a community of cells agrees to outsource their immortality to specialized germ cells uh, that... Um, they entrust with that task, and they themselves uh, accept mortality and uh, apoptosis and all the other things, uh, re regulation and things that go with uh, the multicellular world. It's a dramatic step, uh, and I don't think we have fully worked out uh, how it uh, how it happened uh, or why it happened. Uh, but I'm convinced that that if we understand that step, we'll get uh, new insight into cancer. Conversely, that I see. Uh, cancer as a window on the past. It's uh, by studying cancer we can get some idea of that transition from single to multicellularity. It's not normally viewed that way. It's just viewed as a horrible disease that we've got to get rid of. Um, but uh, actually it is an opportunity uh, to to look at, in a sense, it's it's not quite an alternative form of life, but it's an alternative way of, of doing eukaryotic life uh, in, in a multicellular organism. And I think we, we uh, could get very great insights into uh, life about a billion years ago when these things, uh, the first uh, simple multicellularity began, uh, what, what we're calling Metazoa 1.0. Well, I, I guess, um, what's your role on the SETI post-detection task force? Oh, yes, yes, That's yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, this is, uh, this is uh, interesting. So I mentioned that I have been a sort of SETI fan, a well-wisher, a bystander for almost all my career since when people said, uh, go look for fairies. Um, and over the years, it's become more and more respectable to, to do SETI. Um, and uh, quite by coincidence, I was approached by uh, Ray Norris, a radio astronomer in Australia, 
um, who said, well, I chair something called the SETI Post-Detection Task Group, which the IAA set up some years ago. And he said, uh, I got uh, fed up with doing this. Would I consider taking over? And I thought, well, do I, do I want another chore like this? And then I thought, well, actually, it's not such a chore because uh, the, the point about uh, SETI is it's a very... But the, the point about the success of SETI is that it's a very small probability of a very dramatic discovery. And the impact on science and religion and society as a whole would be immense. And I think we uh, are well advised to think through what that impact might be. Uh, and so this uh, entity exists. It doesn't have a budget, so it doesn't do much. From time to time we meet, um, not very often, not as often as I would like, uh, but I'm in continual touch with uh, other members of this uh, this group. Uh, it's made up of uh, some uh, science uh, journalists and some scientists and uh, a couple of lawyers and a priest and a philosopher and a science fiction novelist. Uh, and uh, uh, our job is, uh, well, the way I like to express it is that if E.T. calls on my watch, I should be the first to know of course, in practice, it would never work out that way. Um, but uh, uh, it, the job is to is to reflect on uh, a number of things like how could we be sure this is a genuine contact or signal or genuine evidence for extraterrestrial technology? Uh, who do we tell and in what order? And what do we do about it? And then if uh, we're going to be proactive, so in the context of radio SETI, uh, which is only, I think, a small part of the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Uh, people always want to know, should we send a reply or should we be active anyway? Should we be beaming messages into the cosmos, as people do sometimes uh, just for fun? Should we be doing this systematically? And then if so, who speaks for Earth and all those sorts of things. So it's, it's fun to think about. Uh, there was a time when the, the job of planetary protection officer was being advertised. I thought it would be rather cool to be both planetary protection officer and chair of the SETI Post Detection Committee, and I could have a card that said, uh, uh, Earth is safe in my hands. Um, but I, unfortunately, I couldn't become the planetary protection officer because you have to be a US citizen. Uh, a Brit is not deemed to be suitable enough to protect the planet, I'm afraid. <laughs> Okay, now I think we uh, probably are, are winding okay. down here. Um, so if, if there's any last minute uh, questions, if not, what I'll say to you is that uh, much of the stuff I've been talking about is captured in my books, uh, The Eerie Silence is the one I mentioned, that's specifically about search for extraterrestrial intelligence, but other things we might search for, other signatures of alien technology, uh, not just radio signals, but footprints of alien technology. Uh, that would not be messages, but just uh, uh, would enable us to say we're not alone in the universe. But there's also a lot about just uh, the Drake equation and the origin of life. And then an earlier book uh, that came out originally under the title of The Fifth Miracle, The Search for the Origin of Life, that was in the late uh, 80s, and it got reprinted uh, just under the title of The Origin of Life by Penguin. I'm not sure that that's available in the United States. Uh, the original Fifth Miracle is uh, still and that's uh, an in-depth look at uh, you know, what is life and how might it have come to exist and life in the deep subsurface, life on Mars, all that stuff. Um, and in spite of the fact this was written over 10 years ago, uh, most of it, I think, remains current. I think you could still read that book with profit. So after that I think shameless plug <laughs> for my own books, I think probably we could call it a day. And thank you all for your attention and good luck with your own research. And let me know if anything I said sounds really stupid or really inspirational. And particularly let me know if it leads you to do any research, uh, for which I deserve some acknowledgement. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, Paul.